Well, praise God for this yet another opportunity to be in the house of the Lord and to be able to stand and to share uh, the good news gospel of Jesus Christ. I, um, I'm excited uh, to be able to continue on in this message that I believe God has been inspiring toward our hearts. As he's wanting, he's been uh, <clears throat> ministering to us in a manner and capacity about having the right kind of mind, uh, having the right kind of outlook, yeah. having the right kind of expectation. Um, so this, if I was to finally give a title to this, um, this message that I've been speaking on, it would be the saving of the soul. Amen. The saving of the soul. Remember that the soul is the mind, the will, and the emotions of man. And how critically important it is for us to understand that this part of us, all parts, all of us, all parts of us, spirit, soul, and body, God desires to be saved and set free. God desires, he says, he wills that, that the whole of you, spirit, soul, and body, would be preserved blameless until the coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. And so I want to jump in here on this message because I got a lot I want to say this morning. I almost got some slides for you, but I said, no, I don't even want them to try to write what's on the slide. Just listen. Okay. <laughs> So you lay hands on your head right now and say, Father, I thank you that I am attentive this morning. And there is a supernatural ability to grasp the concepts and the principles that are being depicted in this message. Help me to see me and where these apply to me because I'm willing to give you room to work on that area in my life so that I can glorify you in the earth and then I can experience your best concerning me. Amen. All right. So I, I, I know y'all would have kept singing if I let you and y'all tricked me last week, but we, I said we ain't going there this week. Y'all were trying to, y'all pulled, y'all reeled me in last week. <laughs> and uh, we had a good time in the Lord, so I believe that's how heaven wanted to move. There was a supernatural flow of the Holy Spirit, and we, we, we don't ever want to go against his plan. We want to go with his plan because some things can happen when we do. All right, so we've talked to you about, um, uh, uh, oh, just so that if you didn't get the message that we're going to the movies today, right, at 2.30, at we're going to the movies and we're going to go see The Forge. And we chose to go see that as a church family. Um, there's, a, there's a few seats left. Um, we, we chose to go see that as a church family because you'll see a depiction in that movie um, of some of what we're talking about as we're talking about um, the state of mind and stress responses or trauma, traumatic experience responses and um, how it shapes our behavior. And so the reason why it's important for us to become aware of the, the essence of this is because until you recognize what's going on, until you get an understanding of what is happening in your body, in your mind, in your body, um, you, you'll just keep moving like you've been moving, and you don't recognize the need to address it. And so um, as being a... Uh, okay, so I'll read the scripture first, Peter 4... And 12, you all probably can quote it because we've had it several times, but it says, Beloved, I think it not strange, beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trials, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you. But he went on to say, But rejoice inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's suffering, and that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. 
All right, so we, we've quantified that. We have, we have established that, um, that trials will come in life. Sometimes things are just happening because they're happening. Sometimes things are happening because the enemy is coming for me. He's coming at me. He's trying to get me off my stance or off my course. Um, he's trying to interrupt you being able to fulfill the plan of God for your life. Um, so he wants to get you distracted with some things. And then sometimes things happen because of the decisions we make. Can we be mature about that this morning? Sometimes the decisions that we make um, result, have, they have consequences. And the consequences um, are not always uh, favorable. They don't feel so good. Um, but it's because of some of the decisions we make. And some of what we'll talk about today will even help you to recognize that some of the decisions you make are based on stress responses. So I want to be able to get you to the place where you recognize um, what's happening, and then you take authority and interrupt it. All right? So um, we believe the glory of God to be revealed in our situations, in our circumstances. And sometimes when we have these encounters, we, as I said before, we feel overwhelmed. We, feel de we might feel <clears throat> getting wounded, feel devastated, even um, to the point of feeling hopeless. But we have to learn to walk in victory. And so um, I think that even though I'm sharing some things with you about um, the, the soulish aspect of, your, of you, um, your mind, your will, and your emotions, if you get this part, um, it will, it, it's important because your spirit, a born-again spirit, a born-again recreated spirit that has the Holy Spirit living on the inside of it, wants to do the will of God. So what you, everything that you have on the inside of you, you have what you need on the inside of you to be able to do it. But there's three parts to you, spirit, soul, and body. So if your spirit, in your spirit, there is a desire to, to do the will of God concerning you, that's great. But how many of you know your mind can interrupt you doing that? And so... Um, and so the thoughts that we think and how we see situations, how we respond to situations, behaviors that present affect how, what the outcomes are. So um, we can't disc this part, all right? Even, even if it's just renewing your mind with the word of God, that's something that needs, the scripture says needs to take place. But I want to help you see a little bit more, with more clarity. So, uh, so we talked about a little bit about strongholds um, on our uh, last time that we were up, and we talked about how they can present, and they can put a person in a position where they feel like um, they're in captivity, there's confinement, there's detention, imprisonment, um, almost feeling incarcerated, right? like you don't have the liberty to walk into the, into the goodness the, and the best that God has for you because um, the strongholds in your mind can restrict and impede um, or even interrupt your success. Um, a lot of times those strongholds exist from experiences um, that we've had in life that, um, that affected us. And so I shared with you about how, the, the, how um, I almost drowned when I was 12 years old because I went and jumped off the, the diving board and went into the deep end. I wasn't thinking about the momentum that would go with jumping off the diving board. I had been practicing on the side. And I talked to you about how when I went down, I was doing everything that we practiced and decided, uh, okay, now I should be to the top about now. And, I, and when I didn't get there, then I, I went into a panic. So the young lady came and she uh, saved me from my panic. And she uh, brought me to safety. But that was a traumatic experience for me that continued to influence and impact my life over the course of time. And so it impacted me. Um, uh, and I, and it was a, it, there was a fear of the water. And so I didn't, I didn't learn to, how to swim. I didn't, I didn't spend time around the water. So, then, um, so I didn't have capacity. If I had gone down in the water, I would have been in trouble even in the shallow end, okay? So 
Um, the enemy comes in multiple situations. Um, he comes on the Rock River and almost sends me over the side. That would have been the end of, of the story. I wouldn't be standing here today doing what I'm doing. Um, the will of God concerning me. Okay, and then uh, the Lake Lanier experience, um, when we were out there on the, the lake and all of, that, all of that turbulence happened and the Lord um, had me to go into the place of intercession and uh, declare uh, that we would, be, we would be able to make it back to the shore, and we did. So I'm standing here today. So there, then there was going to Mexico, I told y'all, and I said to y'all, we, um, we scuba dive. Now, let me just tell you, I'm doing good to be on top of the water. So it wasn't scuba, it was snorkeling. I'm sorry, I said it wrong. And so um, when I got out in the water and it was so deep, clear, beautiful, you could see um, hundreds, of whatever, that, how, whatever the depth was, it was there. Um, and I panicked. Um, and so I wanted to get out of the water because everything I had learned, I felt like I had forgot. I, and, I, and I didn't want to be out there. And I had on a life jacket. <laughs> so um, anyways, so this, this, this stronghold had built up in my mind that I cannot, I cannot swim and I'm not going to be successful at swimming. So even when I went to high school, I forgot to put that part in there. When I went to high school, we were required to take swim, swim, swim classes. And I would swim and do well. And I and then then I and I go from the shallow end to the deep end. But every time it was time to take the path, the test to pass to go to the inter intermediate class, this mental block would come, and I would say, if I pass, I'll have to jump off the diving board. So, what did I do? I failed every time, <laughs> on purpose, because my mind, this stronghold was on my mind that I couldn't do it. Okay, so I want you to recognize how things get a grip on you and impede you. Because there's some of you in here that, that God wants to move in some ways and use you in some ways, but he can't, he can't, he can't get, get no movement. He can't advance you because you got this thing that's um, impeding you. Um, it's impeding you. And it may be the fruit of some traumatic experience that you had um, in life. But I'm here to tell you, you can overcome. So what I'm endeavoring to do is to normalize the fact that traumatic experiences are commonplace in life. When they occur, what we uh, perceive about them or think about them stimulates our emotions. And the emotional response triggers behavioral responses. Y'all get that? So you have an experience. It's, tr it, 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 it's, it's an experience that you mark as traumatic. And, um, and it's, it's the traumatic experience happens based on what you perceive about the situation, what you think about it. And it stimulates the thoughts that come in your mind, stimulate your emotions, and the emotional response triggers behavioral responses. So if I get afraid that I may run, that's a behavioral response. That's the behavioral response at the end. Um, because something uh, traumati brought, uh, traumatized me or uh, alarmed me, startled me. Um, and so ultimately, when these things happen over and over again, we develop a coping style. And it becomes our way of managing our distress. So now, um, Viktor Frankl, he's a psychologist that said, between stimulus and response, there is space. Think about that. I get stimulated uh, because uh, that car almost hit me. And then he says, there is a re there, I have that experience, and then there's a space where I have, a re where I have room to decide how I'm going to respond. Um, so that space is our power to choose our response. 
In our responses lies our growth and our freedom. Good saying. So how we choose to respond or we, uh, affects, is, is affected by um, our growth, the state of mind. So what I want you to understand, I'm do, being technical for a few minutes here um, without trying to overwhelm you, uh, the experience is not the trauma. So we always say, I, I didn't had trauma in my life. Actually, the, the experience is not the trauma. None of these are really the cause. Um, so, so let me throw out a few examples, like um, a natural disaster. I lived through Hurricane Andrew. That was a, nat a natural disaster. I was in Miami by myself. Pastor left me. Um, <laughs> I lived through Hurricane Andrew, and I had no clue, um, no reference for her hurricanes because I grew up in the Midwest, and I just, it never dawned on me that when they kept saying a hurricane is coming, it was any significance to that. Um, because the sun was out, shining bright. It was the most beautiful day. But they said, kept saying a hurricane is coming. I had no reference for that. And, and, but I got one real quick when I went to the grocery store to get something to eat to cook my dinner, and I realized it was nothing on the shelf. <laughs> and people had put up shutters on everything, and I said, oh, this may be very real. Uh, so I had a choice on how to manage that. I could panic, I could walk in my believer's authority. And I chose to walk in my believer's authority. When my power, right before my power went out, I wasn't going to even tell you this, but right before my power went out, I was watching the news. I lived in Hollywood, Florida. The news said the hurricane, the eye of the hurricane will hit Hollywood. I said, devil, you may be trying to come for me, but I ain't going. And so um, where I went to in prayer, and, and uh, began to decree what I knew the word said my promise was. I'm an heir of soteria. Yeah. All right? Yeah. That, 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 that I have safety and preservation, and the angels have been given charge to watch over me and keep me in all my ways. I went there, and I called them, I summoned them into performance. And so right then the power went out. Now, when, I, I, I'm sorry that it hit any any place and brought, brought tragedy to uh, people, but it shifted right when it got to the shoreline and it went south. Um, and so anyway, so, I, so natural disasters, mass uh, interpersonal violence, um, domestic fires, motor vehicle accidents, rape, sexual assault, physical assault, um, family or partner battery, torture, war, child abuse, um, or maybe a person who works in an emergency um, type of capacity, they, like a, a firefighter or a police officer, um, people who have those kind of work experiences. Um, those, are tra tra those are traditional types of experiences that lead to trauma. Um, and so I'm not intending to trigger anybody this morning. But if, um, if you feel yourself getting triggered, it's okay to step out and do some deep breathing and, re and recover yourself, all right? Um, and then uh, see me afterwards. So none of these are really the cause of trauma. All of them, however, can impact the central nervous system. And when the central nervous system gets out of balance, that's when we have trauma. So... Um, so what I want, I want to give you a little bit more on this, and then I'm going to move on. OK, so when the automatic nervous system is in balance, everything is regulated in the body. It works automatically without a person even consciously um, having any effort. When it's out of balance, then things shift in the body. So symptoms of activation within uh, the balance system, uh, these are the symptoms that present. When you are in the norm, the parasympathetic um, 
uh, state, which is the cool state. We'll call that the cool state. Okay, when you're in that state, it, 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 you, it, your body is in a place of calm and it's, it's being regulated well, so it promotes digestion, good digestion. It, um, you have intestinal motility. You have uh, fuel storage, which increases insulin activity in your body. Um, because we need insulin to break down sugar, right? Um, so that we can be healthy. Um, resistance to infection. So your autoimmune system is working pretty good. And then circulation in your body is happening well. Um, you're able to release endorphins, and so your mood is good. Y'all with me? Um, it decreases the heart rate, so your blood pressure can be normalized, okay? But when you have the sympathetic nervous system, part of the nervous system activated, it's the hot system, okay? <laughs> So it accelerates the heart rate. So your, hearts, you, 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 your heart starts beating real fast. You can feel that. Anybody had that experience before? It constricts the blood vessels. It raises, and then bl the blood pressure raises. Muscles tense up. And um, you, have, you have a physical sensation with it. Um, and then... What it also does is inhibits um, insulin from being produced in the body. So when insulin is not produced, then it can't break down the sugars, and then other things happen. So some people who may have developed out type 2 diabetes, it may have been influenced by the level of stress they were constantly experiencing in their bodies. Um, I know most of y'all would like to accept that as the reason, right? <laughs> Not what we eat, <laughs> right? Okay. So, um, so I want you, I want you to understand that um, when we have experiences that trigger these types of things, um, it creates a stress response in us, which is the hot system is activated. So when I start feeling that. My head isn't as clear. I, I, I may feel like panic. Anxiety stirs up. So I don't function as well. So, um, so that can happen in a, a all of a sudden a, an experience that, like the car tr um, just hit me, okay? It could happen there. But then there are activators that are low intensity. The frequent, and, and the issue is these things keep happening over and over again, but they're, they're not the big thing. So the frequency at which it occurs creates a cumulative harm effect such as, these are some examples of what I'm talking about, a chaotic environment. Maybe you grew up in a chaotic environment. That is creating distress in you. Uh, maybe um, there's, you grew up in an environment where there was aggression that can create distress in you and trigger over time, continuously over time, it can create a hot response in your, in your body. Um, maybe you lived in an environment where it was punitive and you were punished a lot. Or um, maybe you, there was uh, some instability in the family and it represented financial instability, emotional instability, um, maybe not always having a place to call home. Those kinds of things, cumulative over time, can create um, this type of response. So trauma, what it is, is the body's reaction to when the hot system is activated. And it's, it, 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 that dominance of that hot system being activated is what we call trauma, okay? And so, uh, so I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna end this here. Um, you might have had childhood adverse experiences like uh, physical abuse, emotional abuse, um, things like that. If it was happening over and over again, then your system is functioning on the level of um, what we call fright or flight. 
And, and when you're functioning on that level, when you're living there, you're not, it's not good for you because God didn't give that into us inherently um, for us to live in that space of fright or flight. Like um, uh, you, you heard of maybe somebody, a car fell, uh, rolled over and the baby's under the car and the mother picks up the car. She taps into some adrenaline. Um, she taps into um, stress hor hormones that, that present in the moment to help her get through it. Okay, but when it's over and you sit down, you're like, oh, oh my God, how did I do that? I don't even, you have no, it's like, I don't, I don't have a clue how, how I managed that because you were, you were operating in that hot zone. You were, you were having, it was a stress response and there, that ability came to you. Now, and sometimes we have that experience and we do flight. We take off. Uh, you know, Afro-American people, when we, <laughs> we get, get a, we, we, we see a scary movie, or, you know, we, and, we say, and we say, why are they just standing there? Why don't they run? You know, because you know that's what we do. Yeah. Forget that. We gone. Okay. <laughs> right. So you flight. And then sometimes people just, it's so much, they freeze. Okay. All right. So y'all getting the essence of that? Okay, so here are some of the behaviors that might, might, might produce, might be produced in those moments. Anger, um, aggression, defensiveness, impulsiveness, hostility, irrational behavior. Uh, being self-centered is something that can present when people feel threatened because it's the safety and the security that they're looking for. So when they feel threatened, they can become more self-centered. They can have poor focus. They can become inattentive. They, um, they can have sleep disturbances. Um, they can themselves become coercive and bossy. They, um, they, can, they can experience tantrums. And you're like, why are you acting like that? Because they're having a tantrum, because they're feeling this sense of insecurity that is stirring up this, this uh, sense in their physical body. They may call names, they may hit, they may fidget, they may be hyperactive, they may have anxiety, they might be, be irritable. They might not even be able to speak, get to formulate and get their words out, okay. So these are some of the things that present when we're having a real trauma a traumatic experience that leads to this trauma. But what is valuable is that the studies show that we can recover. So post-traumatic growth can happen. You, 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 can, you, can, you can come out of that state of being and you can grow from the experience. So you can be better for it when it's over. All right? Or when you, when you adjust um, how you deal with it. So it's, um, uh, what is post-traumatic growth? It's a positive change experience as a result of the struggle with a major life crisis or traumatic event. So when you come out and you, you are functioning better, then you can, you can be more successful in life. So I said uh, to you all, God is concerned about the traumatic experiences that present in your life. A lot of people think he's not, he doesn't care. Yes, he does. And that's, he's written about all types of things. He's, he's inspired it to be written in his word, all types of experiences. But he always shows us how people came out. Better for it. So we, because we're not thinking it's strange, that there's going to be some trials. So, um, so, some, some of the, so what I want you to understand is the reason why we need to get this understanding at, is so that we can adjust our posture because I believe that how we're managing the soulish realm is bleeding and impeding what our spirit is wanting to do, what God wants us to do. 
So let, let's address it all because if you can get the, the soul in agreement with what the, is in, in the spirit and then the two agree, you can command the body to come on get with the program. Okay. So um, I start thinking about this thing called a generational curse. Um, is, uh, a generational curse is a curse that is passed through the family line from one generation to the next. It is a negative pattern or a habit that has been passed from one generation to the next is what is how they define it. So some of this, uh, how we act and how we cope, how we manage, um, is learned to behavior. Stuff that you, you witnessed in your environment. And you, you saw, oh, I guess that worked for them, so you adopt it. You mimic it. And so it, this, when you do this um, as a response to a stress situation, um, a stress-triggering situation, it evolves over time and becomes what we call coping stop. And so we tend to manage this way quite frequently. So what, in the time I have left, I want to go to Genesis because I want to show you an example of this in the word of God. Um, go to Genesis, the 20th chapter. Now, I'm, I'm going to read a little bit here. So um, you already made the confession. Let's walk in it. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right, because it's a lot. But I think that it will help us to see some things. Um, this, this is a story um, about Abraham and Sarah as um, they were, they were uh, journey on their journey. Okay, so I'm just going to pick up chapter 20, verse 1. And Abraham journeyed from thence toward the, the south country and dwelled between Kadesh and Shur and sojourned in Gear. And Gear, I'm sorry. And Abraham said of Sarah, his wife, she is my sister. And Ambevelet, king, the king, sent and took Sarah. So Abraham arrives in this city. He has Sarah, his wife, with him, but he panics, he becomes afraid, and he tells the people in the city, this is my sister. So when Ambivalek found out about it, he called for Sarah. She's a beautiful woman. So, um, and, and, uh, but God came to Ambivalek in a dream by night, and said to him, Behold, thou art but a dead man. For the woman which thou have taken, for she is a man's wife. And Ambivalek had not come near her. And he said, Lord, will thou say also a righteous nation? Will thou say, slay also a righteous nation? Said he not unto me, She is my sister. So Ambivalek is a pleading to the Lord. He's like, save this right, will you not save this righteous nation? Nation? Because he, um, he not, he said, not he unto me, she is my sister. He said, didn't Abraham tell me that? And even, she even, she herself said, so Sarah went along. He is my brother. And um, the integrity of my heart, in the integrity of my heart and the innocency of my hand, have I done this? So he pleaded his case. And God said unto him, in a dream, yea, I know that thou didst this in the integrity of thy heart, for also withheld thee from, um, for I also withheld thee from sinning against me. Therefore, suffer I thee not to touch her. Now, therefore, restore the man and his wife, for he, is a, for he is a prophet, and he shall pray for um, thee, and thou shalt live. And if thou restore her not, know that thou shalt surely die, thou and all that are thine. And the God was meaning business. Then Ambevelech arose early in the morning and called all his servants and told um, these things to them, and the men were so afraid, and Bivolet, uh called Abraham and said unto him, "What have thou done unto to us? And what have I, uh, and what have I offended thee? And thou have brought on 
me and on my kingdom a great sin. Thou have done deeds unto me that ought not be done. And Ambivalent said unto Abraham, What sawest thou that thou had done this thing? And Abraham said, Because I thought surely the fear of God is not in this place, and they will slay me for my wife's sake. And yet, indeed, she is my sister. She is the daughter of my father, but not the daughter of my mother. And she became my wife. All right, so what Abraham had done was lied and he kind of manipulated the truth for his gain. And it came to pass when God caused, caused me to wonder from the father's house that I said unto her, this is thy kindness which thou show unto me at every place whether um, ye shall come, say of me, he is my brother. And Ambevelet took sheep and oxen and men servants and women servants and gave them to Abraham and restored him Sarah, his wife. He's like, take your wife. And, and by the way, I'm going to give you some stuff to take with you. I, I, I just want to be in your favor with God again. And Ambivalent said, Behold, my land is before thee, dwell where it pleaseth thee. And unto Sarah, he said, Behold, I have given thy brother a thousand pieces of silver. Behold, he is, he is to thee a covering for the eye, for, of the eyes unto all that are with thee and with all other thus she was reproved. Okay, so Abraham prayed unto God and God healed Ambivalent and his wife and his maid servants and they bear children. For the Lord had fast closed up all the wounds of the house of Ambivalent because of Sarah and Abraham's, Abraham's wife, because of Sarah. So God had shut their wound just that fast. Because God had a plan for, for Sarah. God had a plan for Abraham. And if he had done this thing, the enemy trying to interrupt the plan of God. And the Lord visited Sarah, and the Lord did unto Sarah as he spoke. For Sarah conceived and bare Abraham, a son in his old age, and at the set time of which God had spoken to him. And Abraham uh, called his, the name of his son that was born Isaac. And Abraham circumcised Isaac. And Abraham was a hundred years old when the, he conceived this son. A hundred years old. Glory. What do I have to look forward to? <laughs> Pastor McDowell, a hundred years old. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and the glory shall be revealed. It's all right, Zoe. <laughs> That's how you got here. <laughs> all right. Okay. Back to the word. Okay. <laughs> and um, so the story goes, I'm not going to read it all. Y'all know the story. He had, he had Isaac. And um, so um, he went through this encounter with God where he went up to do burnt offering and unto God on the mountaintop, and he took nothing with him but the child, because he was told to take the child. And he was going with the intent of sacrificing Isaac, and you all know God had a ram in the bush, and um, uh, he, he passed the test. He passed the test to prove that he could be called the father of many nations. All right, so let's go with me over to, um, go with me to chapter 24. Hang in here with me. Chapter 24. Um, and I'm picking up at verse... Uh, mm. What did I do? Uh, okay, yes. So at chapter 24, um, and I'm picking up at verse 55. 54, and they did eat and drink, and he and the men and that were with him and tarried all night, and they rose up in the morning. He said, send me away unto my master. And her brother and her mother said, let the damsel abide with us a few days at the, the uh, least 10. After that, she shall go. And he said unto 
them, hinder me not, seeing the Lord has prospered my way. Send me away that I may go to my master. And um, they said, we will call the damsel, inquire at her mouth. Okay, so they called Rebecca and said unto her, will thou go with this man? So what has happened here is um, uh, Isaac, the son of Abraham, has his eyes have fallen on Rebecca, and he wants her as a wife. Okay, and so I'm going to go down to verse 61. And Rebecca rose and her damsels, and they rode upon the camel and followed the man, and the servant took Rebecca and went his way. And Isaac came from where he was, went to the south country, and went to meditate in the field. And Rebecca lifted up her eyes, and when she saw Isaac, she lighted off the cam camel, camel. And she said unto the servant, what man is this that walketh in the field to meet us? And the servant told her who he was, and um, the servant told Isaac all the things that had been said, and so he took, uh, he, he pursued uh, Rebecca. Okay, I want to move on, because I'm, I'm trying to go down 25, 21. Chapter 25, 21. So now, and Isaac, so he marries Rebecca, and Isaac entreated the Lord for his wife, because she was barren. And the Lord was um, entreated of him, and Rebekah, his wife, conceived. And the children struggled together within her. And she said, if it be so, why am I thus? And she went to inquire of the Lord. And the Lord said unto her, two nations are in thy womb, and, and two manner of people shall I separate from thy bowels. And the one people shall be stronger than the other people, and the elder shall serve the younger. And when her days to be delivered were fulfilled, behold, there were twins in her womb. And the first came out red all over um, like a hairy garment, and they called his name Esau. And then um, after that came his brother out, and his hand took hold of Esau's heel. Like, you ain't leaving me. And his name was called Jacob. And Isaac was threescore years old um, when she bare him. And the boys grew, and Esau was a cunning hunter and a man of the field, and Jacob was a plain man dwelling in tents. So he, still, he did more things hanging out close to home. And the boys grew, and uh, I'm sorry, and Isaac loved Esau. So the dad had a favorite for Esau because he did eat of his venison. But Rebekah loved Jacob. And Jacob sought um, a pottage, and Esau came from the field, and he was faint. And Esau said to Jacob, feed me, I pray thee, with um, some red pottage. And uh, for I am faint, therefore was his name called Edom. And Jacob said, sell me this day thy birthright. So he's so hungry, he's so famished, he feel like he's, he's, he's not going to make it. He's like, come on, please, just give me something to eat. And so Jacob takes advantage of this moment, and he says, sell me thy birthright. What was he talking about? The firstborn was the one who was destined to receive the inheritance, right? Um, and Jacob says, swear... Uh, and Esau said, Behold, I am at the point to die. And what profit shall this birthright do to me? So he was like, he wanted food more than he wanted his birthright in that moment. And Jacob said, Swear to me this day. And he swore unto him, and he sold his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and potted of lentils, and he did eat and drink and rose up and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. He dishonored it. He disrespected what it represented for a, a bowl of porridge. Mm. So, um, okay, so let's, let's go on. Chapter 26, verse 1. And there was a famine in the land besides the uh, first famine that was in the days of Abraham. And Isaac went unto Ambivalent, king of king, who was the king of the Philistines, and the Lord appeared unto him and said, go not down to Egypt. So God informed him not to, to go to Egypt. Um, 
he informed Isaac not to go down to Egypt, but to go to where Ambelic was. He says, sojourn in that land, so stay in that land, and I will be with thee and will bless thee, for unto thee and to thy seed I will give all these countries, and I will perform the oath that I swear unto Abraham thy father. So it's like the promise is continuing. The promise is, is uh, that God made to Abraham, it comes down to Isaac now. And he told him where you need to abide. He says, and I will make thy seed to multiply the stars of the heaven and will give thy seed and um, all these countries and thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. So um, Abraham, um, because that Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes and my laws. Now Isaac, he's saying, do, you do what I tell you to do. Obey. And um, so when he, got, he went to where God told him to go, and the men of the place asked him of his wife. He said, she's my sister. Sound familiar? For he feared to say, she is my wife. Lest, said he, the men of the palace shall kill me for Rebekah because she was fair to look upon. All right, so here we go again. What's presenting? What emotional Emotion is experienced, is presenting fear. And, um, and when, the, when he, he feared, then he lied. Y'all get that? So um, that's just an example. And so it came to pass when he had been there a long time, and Ambevelic the king um, looked out the window and saw, and behold, Isaac was sporting with Rebekah, his wife. And Ambivalent called Isaac and said, behold of, behold, of a surety, she is thy wife. Because I saw what y'all was doing. Um, and uh, he said, uh, and how save thou, she is my sister. And Isaac said unto him, because I said, lest I die for her. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? His father did the same thing. Generational stuff. And Ambivalent said, what is this that thou have done unto us? One of the people might um, lightly have leaned with thy wife, and thou shouldest have brought guiltiness upon us. And Ambivalent charged all the people, saying, he that touches this man or his wife shall surely be put to death. Then Isaac sold in that land and received in the same year a hundredfold, and, and the Lord blessed him. Glory to God. Uh, hallelujah. There's some benefit in sowing, just side note. Uh -huh. when, when you sow where God tell you to sow, there's benefit. He got a hundredfold return in the same year. I'm going to start praying that prayer. Amen. Um, okay. Uh, and this man waxed great and went forth and grew, um, <clears throat> and went forth and grew, and he became very great, for he had possession of flocks, possession of herds, and great store of servants, and the Philistines envied him for all the wells which his father's um, servants had digged in the days of Abraham. Because remember, this is the same place God sent Abraham in his day. Um, and Abraham had digged some wells. And, all of the, and so as the story goes, he prospered from those wells. Okay, I'm not, I can't read it all, so I'm going to go on. Um, so, huh. When, he, when the fear came upon him, he was motivated by this fear to lie like his father Abraham and to manipulate the truth. Okay, so now, 27, chapter 27. Chapter 27, I'm starting at verse 1. Um, so... And it came to pass that when Isaac was old and his eyes were dim, y'all know the story, he could not see, and he called Esau, his eldest son, and said unto him, My son, and he said unto him, Behold, here am, am I. And he said, Behold now, I am old. I know not the day of my death. Therefore, take, I pray thee, the weapons, thy quiver and thy bow, and go out into the field and, and uh, take some venison. Then make some, me some savory meat such as I love and bring it to me that I may eat that my soul may bless thee before I die. So he, Isaac was thinking that he was close to death and he wanted to bestow the blessing on, on uh, Esau. 
But Rebekah heard when Isaac spoke to Esau, his son, and Esau went to the field uh, to hunt for venison and to bring it. And Rebekah spake unto Jacob, her son, saying, Behold, I heard thy father speak unto Esau, thy brother, saying, Bring me venison and make me savory meat that I may eat and bless thee before the Lord, um, before my death. Okay, so, um, and so now therefore, my son, obey my voice. So mama getting in the middle of this. And mama is remembering the word of the Lord to her when she said what's going on inside of me when the two, the two sons were there. And, um, and so now she wants to help God out um, in achieving that goal. Okay, and so, so she, um, she tells him to go to the flock and fetch for me thence two good kids of goat, and I will make thee savory meat for thy father, such as he loves. She says, I'm going to cook him that meat that he asked Esau to cook, and thou shalt bring it to thy father that he may eat and that he may bless thee before his death. And Jacob said to Rebekah, his mother, Behold, Esau, my brother, is a hairy man, and I am a smooth man. My father, preadventure, will fill me, and I shall be, it shall seem to him as a deceiver, and I shall bring a curse upon me and not a blessing. So he said he's going to seem like a deceiver, but he was. And his mother said unto him, Upon me be thy curse, thy son. Only obey my voice and go and fetch um, them, uh, me them. And he went and fetched and brought them to the mother. And his mother made a savory meat such as the father loved. And Rebecca took, um, she made the meat and all of that. And then, uh, let's see, I'm going to go down. Um, and he came unto the father, verse 18, and, the, uh, and said, my father. And he said, here am I, who art thou, my son? And Jacob said unto his father, I'm Esau, a lie, thy firstborn. I have done according to thou, um, as thou badest me. Arise, I pray thee, sit and eat of my venison, that my soul will be blessed. And Isaac said unto his son, how is it that thou hast found it so quickly, my son? And he said, because the Lord thy God brought it to me. Oh, he's making the lie deeper. Uh, you get in the habit of, of some things. And Isaac said unto Jacob, come near, I pray thee, that I may feel thee, my son, whether thou may be my very son Esau or not. So he's suspicious. And Jacob went near unto Isaac, his father, and he felt him and said, the voice is Jacob's voice, but the hands are the hands of Esau. Ah, so, uh, uh, and he discerned him not because his hands were hairy and his brother Esau's hands, so he blessed him. And, he, and so he, ble he bestowed the blessing upon Jacob, right? And then when, by the time Esau got back um, to give, bring his venison to uh, Isaac, he had already done this. So now when I Esau finds out about it, he is devastated. He's broken. But um, what we see here is that that uh, tendency to lie was going down through the family. Um, it was dis the, the, the tendency to have manipulation and deception. And so um, Rebecca was the author of this particular situation. And if we were to look back at where she came from, which is where I was trying to go, it, it, it flowed in the family. Um, so, because when Esau got upset, um, um, then the mama told her, told him, told Jacob to flee and to go to my brother Laban and to take up residence there and he'll take care of you and give time for Esau to cool off. <laughs> and so, um, Jacob had, um, while he was on his route there, um, because there was a, there was covenant with Abraham and he was, there was covenant with Isaac. He has an encounter with God. Um, that's in chapter uh, 10. Uh, I'm sorry. That's in chapter 28, verse 10. I'm not going to read it. But he has an encounter with God on his way. And uh, the Lord speaks to him and, he, and, and tells him that the blessing that he promised to Abraham, that was promised to Abraham, that that would come on him. And so he... He goes here and he's taking a refuge for the night. I will pick up at verse um, um, 
verse 11 in, in 28. He says, And he lighted upon a certain place and tarried there all night because the sun was set. And he took of the stones of that place and put them for, a pill, for pillows and lay down in that place to sleep. And he dreamed, and behold, a ladder went up on the earth and the top of, the, of it reached to heaven. And behold, the angels of God ascended and descended on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it. And he said, I am the Lord God of Abraham, thy father, and the God of Isaac, and the land where I put upon thou liest, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed, and thy, and thy seed shall be, a, shall be the dust of the earth, same thing he said to Abraham, and thou shalt spread abroad the west and to the east, and so he, he decrees this blessing and tells him that, that thing that was proclaimed to Abraham, Isaac, and now it comes down to you through the lineage. And so Jacob at that point makes a vow, and he says, uh, surely if God will be with me and will keep me in this way that I go and will give me bread to eat and raiment to put on so that I come again to my father's house in peace, then shall the Lord be my God. So he enters in relationship with him, covenant with him. And, um, and he says, this stone which I have set for a pillar shall be God's house and all that thou shall give me, I will surely give a tenth unto thee. Okay, so, so he understood where his blessings were coming from. And he honored God to give him the tenth like Abraham did, who was his father, his grandfather, and who is our spiritual father. Just, just a little point there. Y'all missed that? We're supposed to give the tenth like Abraham did. All right. So, so uh, long story short, Jacob goes and he meets Laban. When he uh, gets there, he falls in love with Rachel. And he asked for a hand in marriage. Y'all know the story. Um, and then um, when he asked for a hand in marriage, Laban said yes. And so he, they had a feast, a wedding feast. And then he sent uh, Jacob in to consummate his marriage. And when he woke up in the morning, he realized he had Leah. Her sister. So now when we look at how Laban is, we say, no wonder Rachel... Not Rachel, but Rebecca, because they they develop this behavior, decept, being deceptive, manipulating, lying. Okay, and so um, just like Rebecca deceived Isaac, um, Jacob deceived um, his father. Now um, uh, Laban is deceiving Jacob. Okay. So now, so then Jacob is so in love with, with uh, Rachel, he wants her bad. So he says, I worked seven years for Leah, but I'll work another seven years for, for uh, Rachel. And so he worked 14 years, and after certain 14 years, he was able to marry Rachel. But then when he married her, a sibling rivalry began between the girls. You know, we hear that a lot about um, it's more prevalent with men, but I think uh, in this case, it presented with the girls. Um, uh, and in, uh, let me see, 29th chapter, um, I'm picking up at verse 30. It says, for there was little which thou had before I came and, it, um, uh, no, I won't read that because that's him appealing to him and saying, now I work for 14 years. I have my wives. But now I want my wages so I can be relieved to go and to live my life. So he said, I'll work seven more years for you to give me my wages that are due me because he hadn't been giving him what was due him. Trickster. And so he says, I will pay. So in verse 32, I will pass through all thy flock today, removing from thence all the speckled and spotted cattle and all the uh, brown cattle among the sheep and the spotted and the speckled among the goats and of the sheep shall be my hire. He said, those are the ones that I'd like to be able to walk away with at the end of this journey as, as my pay for serving you. And, um, and so he said, so shall my righteousness answer to me in time to come and when it shall come for my hire before thy face, even one that is not speckled and spotted among the goats and brown among the sheep, that shall be counted stolen with me. So if I take anything other than those, then I, I, I'm a thief. Okay, so Laban said he agreed. 
Okay, so as the story goes, so he, he continues to see about the flock. He continues to, to attend to the flock. And then Jacob comes up with this method. And he figures out a way to help the spotted cattle and the specked, specked, speckled cattle um, to um, flourish better um, and to, 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 to have, have offspring. So that by the time it was time for him to leave, he had more than Laban. Um, uh, so in verse uh, 30, verse 41, and it came to pass when, uh, when soever the stronger cattle did conceive that Jacob laid the rods before the eyes of the cattle in the gutters that they might conceive among the rods. But when the cattle were feeble, he put them not in. So the feebler were Laban's and the stronger were Jacob's. So now he's like, I don't trust him. So I'm going, I'm going, I'm going to secure what I believe is due me. So he manipulates the situation, and the man increased exceedingly, and had much cattle. Oh Lord! I can't, um, so, so what goes on is that he has a dream, and God tells him, "In fact, I'm going to honor you. I'm going to honor how you served him." And I'm going to I'm going to grant you the the the, the cattle that was identified, the speckled and the um, the ring starked. I'm going to honor you and give them to you, um, but um, Jake, uh, Jacob had tried to help this situation along, and he did it in a manner that was not appropriate. And so when it came down to it. Um, the story, the, the, inform, the word got back to Laban that what had happened and that all of Jacob's cattle were flourishing. He had more and he left them the, the feeble and all of that. And Laban got upset. And uh, so Jacob had had this conversation um, he, with uh, Leah and Rachel and said, uh, we, we're going to leave because he's not going to do right by us because Laban said those were his daughters they belonged to him and if he wanted his daughters he needed to stay with him and so he didn't when he said he was going to release him after this this period this seven year period then uh, and he didn't he he Jacob just couldn't trust it so he he got the word of the Lord that he was to leave, and he left. Okay, and when he left, Laban came after him. When Laban came after him, um, he came after him. And it's like, why would, you, why would you leave without telling me? Why would you handle me like this? Trickery again. Deception again. And, um, and then he says, well, I want, he, in essence, he wants to go and to return to his homeland and have his wife and all his possessions with him. And so he, so Laban is upset because he says, well, you left, but you left and you took something that of value to me. And it was, it was um, an idol, um, some items that, that represented his God. And uh, Rachel was the one who took it, unbeknownst to Jacob. And, when, and, and so, so Jacob says, well, you can search everything. Just go ahead and search everything. Because I didn't take anything from you that doesn't belong to me rightfully. And so when he searched and they could not find it, he got, and he got to Rachel, and Rachel was sitting on, um, uh, on her, I guess it was a mule, or, and um, she was sitting there, and she said, Father, excuse me if I don't get up because it's my time of the month. But she was actually sitting on the item that he was looking for, trickery. Deception, lying, um, and so what, what? 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 What am I trying to say? When we when we learn these behaviors, they start. They start in a space um, that may have been in a traumatic event, and then it triggers us to find a way to cope every time every time we're faced with challenges of such. And then when we do that, 
it becomes our coping style. So somebody been telling, not, the, not telling the truth all their life. They're compulsive. It's compulsive. Coping style. I want y'all to get the, the essence. What is your coping style when you feel distressed? What is your go-to? And how do, you, how do you recognize that you're there? You have an experience. The experience reminds you. You think about it. And it triggers you to an emotional response. You get you you trigger to the emotional response, and and then you perform a behavior that is not good. So when you notice yourself being triggered, the goal is when you notice yourself being triggered by the experience, then the better you become at interrupting the cycle. Which is why it's important for us to renew our minds with the word of God. Because we can learn what God says our, our character and our behavior is supposed to be. The kind of responses that glorify him. We can learn that and we can make a conscious decision to do it. Now, it may be that the traumatic experiences that you had were so significant that you might need some support in working through some of those, right? But if you, you're, if you, if you think the worst thing about yourself, if their tendency is, this, is to think the worst thing about yourself, and when you think the worst thing about yourself, there's a, a response that comes from that thought process, you can change that by changing how you see yourself. Are y'all getting any of the concept? Yes. So, um, so some of the stuff, I'm, I'm gonna end it here. Some of the stuff that we're doing that is uh, reflecting our coping style was set in place by various circumstances and situations. But, God wants you free. He wants you to be able to experience his best. So if every time I keep diverting to that, diverting to that behavior, and that behavior impedes his ability to advance what he has toward me, then I, want, I should want to adjust it. Even if it's I just, I believe that I, even if what changes is, I am worth it. I deserve it. Because I am the righteousness of God through Jesus Christ. Changing your mindset, your thoughts. So, we spend a lot of time here trying to get you to adjust this part. And I believe that God had Pastor hone in on this from multiple angles so that we could get it. Because some people are tired. You feel like I'm weary in this, what I, I thought was well doing. And God is saying, I'm ready. I'm ready to drop it. I'm ready for you to have it. I'm ready for you to walk into your inheritance. He's saying that. But he, what he needs is for you to adjust. Y'all follow me? And let go of the old way. All right. I know this was technical. I, but but I, I, I think that if we recognize that I can lose the battle right here. Yes. Yes. Or I can win the battle right here. 
So now I can make a choice about it. Amen? Amen. All right. I know I'm, I, we're, we're after uh, noon. And so if there's anybody here that doesn't know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior and you want to have a relationship with him, we invite you to come right now and to receive Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord. If there's anybody here um, that has been in relationship with God and maybe uh, you've gotten off the beaten path, maybe the, the storms of life, the trials that presented um, it, uh, got you in a place where um, you, you moved away from him instead of toward him, uh, knowing that you can lean and depend on him and trust him for your breakthrough and your victory. I invite you to come and to rekindle your relationship with him. If you're here this morning um, and uh, you want to be empowered with the power of the Holy Spirit through the evidence of speaking in tongues where you can pray and commune with God and, and pray through um, to break through the things that are specific to your situation, we invite you to come to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. If you're here this morning and um, uh, God is dealing with your heart about agape being the place for you, um, then I invite you to come this morning and to be a part of the family. We're growing up together, and we're going to experience the fullness of God, the goodness of God in every capacity. Amen? Amen. So I've given four invitations, salvation, rededication, baptism of the Holy Spirit, and church membership. If you're here, come now. If you're here, come now. All right, none has come. Glory to God. I trust that everybody has all things well, presenting well in their lives. And so I will leave it there. As he played, he's playing that song, I Surrender All. Some of us need to surrender our defenses. Our coping styles. Don't let it be the hindrance. Don't let it be the impediment. God will restore you and he will meet you where you need him to meet you. All right, I'm finished. Pastor McDowell.